Oh, yeah, that's cool. So you're two weeks out from uh, the primary election, that's right? Yep, August 4th. August 4th, and uh, do you feel pretty optimistic about your chances? I am super optimistic. I, uh, you know, we're in a, we're in a great situation here. Um, we've got uh, myself and the incumbent, both the Democrats, and I am obviously uh, to the very left of uh, the corporate Democrat who is uh, seeking a 10th term. Um, and then we've got six Republicans. Wow. And um, this is a this is a solidly blue district. Um, the the um, only serious challenge or the only serious um, sort of contender for uh, for this race um, uh, to, to unseat the the incumbent came back in 2010 with a Republican. Um, and uh, he hasn't had a, a, a Republican come close in in the last 10 years. Um, he's he's pretty much beat uh, all of the Republican um, and libertarian contenders by a by a two to one margin. So, you know, we expect two thirds of the district is going to vote blue uh, in some way, either him or me. We're going to expect the one third to get split up by the six Republicans. Um, and I and I think I've got an easy lane to um, to the general election ballot. And uh, the way things are going and the response I'm getting, having been, um, you know, I just spent the weekend at farmer's markets all over the district uh, and people know who I am. I've had dozens of people come up to me, uh, tell me they've already voted for me. They read my voter guide statement. They've turned in their ballots. Oh, I've got six people in my household. We all voted for you. Um, I, I would not be surprised um, if, if I actually came out on top because this, uh, this incumbent is not particularly well liked in the district. Uh, well, Jason, just for people who uh, maybe this is their first time hearing of you, uh, you're a congressional candidate in Washington Second District, um, and you're running against um, uh, Rick Larson, who uh, you mentioned um, earlier on uh, as we got started. You actually have a tab on your website called Rick's Receipts. Uh, could you tell people a little bit about yourself and how you differ from your opponent, Rick Larson? Well, you know, my history is that I've, I, I've spent uh, – 30 years uh, as an activist. I got out in the streets when I was 19 years old. I was a sophomore at the University of Washington. We invaded Iraq during Desert Storm. Um, I sort of uh, uh, cut my teeth there on street protesting, uh, much like the stuff that we are seeing going on today uh, with defunding. I mean, you know, not, certainly not um, the police brutality response back then, but people getting in the streets, organizing, camping out outside the federal building, so I started doing all of that kind of stuff when I was 19. I was in, I was in, uh, in the streets marching against the Iraq war in 2003 over and over and over again here in Seattle. Um, and so I've been an anti-war activist, environmental activist. I've mar marched with like the Answer Coalition for Palestinian rights, um, you know, march, march in Seattle, uh, certainly every Martin Luther King Day um, for racial justice. Uh, I've marched independently with Black Lives Matter. I mean, we shut a freeway down here in Seattle um, uh, like four years ago, uh, almost got tear gassed then. But that's, I mean, this, it's what I've done my, my entire life. I've also been a, uh, a high school math teacher. I was a high school math teacher for 18 years, union activist down in Olympia protesting with the union um, on educational issues. I've testified in front of our state legislature on education issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I was a member of my uh, union's, local union's executive board for a number of years, uh, elected by my union to represent them at our uh, statewide representative assembly for a number of years. So I'm a known quantity as a progressive activist. Um, contrast with uh, the incumbent who is, uh, like I said, seeking a 10th term. Uh, he's a very corporate Democrat. Um, I, I've always said, um, or I've said throughout this campaign, that I have the best opposition research in the country. And I've actually encouraged other candidates nationwide to kind of take my lead. And I don't want to say my, because I'm not going to take credit for this. My opposition research guy um, is is on Twitter with me. His name's Ben Ocialism. And I keep, um, uh, I keep promoting him as like, follow this guy, follow this guy. Um, and, you know, he has dug into FEC reports. He has tracked newspaper articles, you know, statements that, that Larson has made over the years. And he has put together these articles over the last few months that expose um, right now we've got uh, his war machine funding, um, his health care funding, his Wall Street funding. And I forget what the other one is. Uh, I should look. But right now he's working on the fossil fuel industry. 
funding and his article on the fossil fuel industry pub, um, funding uh, will be coming out very shortly. You know, we've identified that Larson has taken close to a million and a half from the fossil fuel industry over his career. So, it, you know, if people really want to know what the story is behind corporate Democrats like the incumbent that I'm challenging, um, it's all, you know, it's like we say re these days, get the receipts. And we have got the receipts on him going back 20 years. Uh, and so I'm very, uh, I'm very thankful, grateful, and, and proud of the work that uh, my OPA research, Ben, has done. You mentioned that you are a teacher, um, a math teacher for many years, and uh, yeah. you have a policy for quality education for all. And we couldn't have a more pertinent time to implement a policy like that. And I actually wanted to get your insight and see what your perspective is on uh, how we can provide an equal educational opportunities while keeping our school children safe in the time of COVID-19. Um, obviously, if you keep children home from school, um, children who rely on you know school resources like lunch, uh, breakfast, or but also pencils, pens, um, books, that kind of thing, uh, they're not going to have access to them, internet, um, and those kind of learning essentials. How do we balance those two things and make sure that we have a safe, quality learning environment for all of our nation's school children? Well, let, let, me, let me start by saying we cannot send kids back to the classroom right now. I have already made public statements. I've posted them on Twitter, on my Facebook page. Um, you know, my school district last, last week um, emailed home, you know, and, I, and I've, got, I've got three kids all in um, middle school to high school age. Uh, you know, how, how, do, how do we as parents feel about sending them back to school for two days or maybe three days that's a ha that, are, that are half days? And basically I said, uh, I will accept online only. Um, I, there's no way I'm sending my kids back to, you know, this Petri dish of viral infection. My, my wife works with cancer patients. You know, if, if she catches the virus, she's going to end up taking that virus to people who are immunocompromised. And we're talking about, you know, essentially killing people here. Yeah. That's not acceptable, you know, um, and it shouldn't be acceptable to anyone. And we have enough resources. We have enough ingenuity in this country that if we can uh, redefine our priorities, and that's really what it comes down to. I mean, the whole progressive movement is about redefining our priorities. But here in education, if we redefine our priorities and, and how we um, do that, do educational funding, we should be able to figure this out. So do we need to hire more teachers? Do we need to make sure that every student has a laptop? Do we need to make sure that we're investing in, in rural broad, broadband? I mean, there are areas in my district that, that do not pick up. I mean, I've driven out to deliver signs to people where my signal drops, you know, my, my, just on my Google Maps. I'm trying to find a place, my signal drops. So we have got to invest in, um, in infrastructure. I am a supporter of, of, of taking, I, I believe the internet is a, is a utility. It should be nationalized. I believe all public utilities should be nationalized. People don't need, need a profit. I mean, redefining our priorities where the government, the federal government is going to invest in that infrastructure. The reason that these rural areas don't have it is because there's no profit in it. You know, I talk to people in my neighborhoods and they say, we can't get good signal. No, because there's only a few of you guys out in the boonies. It costs them more to lay the cable to get out there than the return that they're going to get on what you're paying into your internet. So no, they don't want to do it. So so that's, you know, that's really, um, you know, you, the, the internet is critical for modern day survival. I mean, it, re it really is to fully engage in, in what modern society is. You have to have access to the internet. So fine, if the, public, if the, if the private companies aren't going to do it, if you can't get Com Comcast to invest in that, you just yank their license, they say, fine, we're going to do it ourselves. So um, I, I think we need to have those, those investments in rural broadband, and we've got to get it done quickly. There's no reason that we can't do those investments. Um, I just want to say, Jason, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I totally agree we need to refocus our priorities, get that uh, internet out to those communities that don't have it. Um, in the meantime, though, while that's not the case, uh, when exactly do you think it would be appropriate to reopen schools? Um, I, I, I kind of just worry that the longer these lockdowns go on, the, the more it's just going to hurt the, the poor people, the uh, lower classes that don't have access to stuff like, uh, you know, high-speed internet or laptop computers. Well, I mean, you know, you, you, you just, so here's the thing. I mean, you have to have people like me and AOC and Rashida and Hillel. I mean, we have to be, I mean, 
to take to get the federal government to do something like that, there has to be massive pressure for them to do it because their priorities are not in the right place. So you're going to have people like me in Congress yelling at them. We're going to be introducing those bills and then we're going to be coming back to our district and saying, here's what our communities need. These people aren't aren't aren't. Uh, fighting for your needs, you know, get involved, get active, throw the bums out. We've got to get people in Congress um, who are going to make sure that that funding is. So I don't want anybody to be under any illusions that I can step into Congress and snap my fingers and all of a sudden we're going to have rural broadband. We're always building that movement, but I am part of building that movement and I will be a loud and aggressive part of building that movement to get our communities the resources they need. Um, so it, it, you know, I just, I just have to go back, go back to saying that sending our kids to a building to be together. I mean, you, it, you, you're, you're ask, you're just asking for trouble, and you're also putting our teachers in danger. You know, um, I, I have a lot of connections with, with educators around the state, um, and they don't want to go back to school either. They're not ready for this either. So, we need to get them the training and the resources to make sure that whatever. Um, education we do that they are as best trained to do it as they possibly can um, but but also to have people understand and we've said this over and over and over, there is no normal now we are going to have to redefine what normal is that's a great now, point I don't I don't have the answers to that uh, the answers to that is going to be a lot of um, thought a lot of collaboration and don't let the politicians define what normal is. Let the educators define what new normal is. Let the parents define what the new normal is. You leave this up to the politicians and you're going to get screwed. So, you know, and I say that as somebody who I don't consider myself a politician. I consider myself an educator and an activist. So I want to be part of that voice, but I want to make sure I'm including all of the voices of the people that I know in the education community and as a parent myself um you know that's where we have to put together the legislation that will move us forward and make sure our kids are educated the best and and i also don't want to say that they're going to have the same kind of education that they would in the classroom until we are beyond that but honestly um you know education i will tell you this as a teacher education in this country has not has not been as funded as it needs needs to be and has not been as equitable as it needs to be and what we're presented with here is a real opportunity to make sure that we do get that equity but again don't leave it in the hands of corporate politicians you will get underserved um, to stay on the topic of education, um, you've said that you support prohibiting for-profit charter schools and uh, prohibiting non-profit charter schools from existing sort of outside of the school board's control and outside of union bargaining. Um, sort of the exact opposite position of our current Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Uh, could you talk about some of the problems with the charter school model? Well, you know, okay, so so first of all, charter schools are taking public school funding and and often people are profiting from it and often those charter schools are completely unaccountable um you know they're supposed to go through the same accreditation process but they're but you know you've got you've got a board of directors maybe that is making some money off of it and anytime you've got somebody who has a bottom line who's saying i want to make some money for myself or i need to make some money for my shareholders the basic function of a, that public service. It's a bad model for public service. You know, if you want to have a private product and you want to sell a product and you're trying to sell a product on the market and, and then you have people profiting on it, they want to put out a good product. You know, they want to uh, make sure that their product is, is marketable, uh, it's efficient, that, they, you know, but, but they're also going to make sure that their production balances in such a way that they are making that profit education is different they don't necessarily the people who are running charter schools you know may have the best of intentions but if they've got profit in part of the equation they will cut corners on the quality of education and the resources that those students get and and you know you have to take profit out of education it's one of the reasons i'm very um uh, opposed to billionaires like mark zuckerberg and bill gates um, having any control uh, of the education system whatsoever. They're not educators. Um, 
you know, if they just want to give some money to the education system, fine. Give some money to the education system and then go away because you don't have it. You don't know what education is about. We are not beholden to that money, you know. So, um, but, edu you know, they – We've, we've got to have substantially more funding in education. And again, you have to ask, I would, I would tell you as a teacher, the things, here are the things that I need in my classroom to make my classroom run as best as it, it can for all students. And so we need to be asking those teachers what, the, what they need in their classrooms and then listening to them, not having you know, a, a business mindset. You can't run schools like a business model. Um, and, and, you know, it is, I think it's an even fair thing to say that, you know, education as an investment in the future, as an investment in, you know, what are students like 25% more or more of our population? That's an investment in the future of this country. Uh, so it, it's kind of scary to say the word unlimited budget, but let's get to teachers and students what they need to be as better as best educated as they possibly can be you can't run that like a business model it's simply not a business model well you talk about there like being a kind of a new normal in education and especially with these you know kind of for-profit initiatives we see uh, bill gates as you mentioned who's kind of uh, apparently going to be taking over the the plan for new york's education or at least having a, a big role in molding that um, yeah. What do you think kind of the future of education is in an online digital space? You know, we talk about shutting down schools for another year or so, but it seems like if we do that, there, there might not be any going back. And uh, these kind of implications can be really, really wide ranging. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Well, I, you know, um, some, some students function uh, well in an online setting. I think the difficult thing for parents, and I experienced this myself with teenagers, um, it's a new thing. It's a different measure of accountability. Um, and so we have to figure out what the accountability measures are for student learning so that we can do effective grading. But grading models have been broken for a long time anyway. Grading models are, um, you know, uh, often, often oppressive <laughs> in, in a way um, and, and don't, don't necessarily serve the students in their advancement of education uh, as well as we would like them to. So I don't, I don't have the answers. I'm not coming to you with necessarily that I have the answers. We can identify the problems. And, and what I'm saying is that we have to define a new normal that is a substantially different normal than yeah. the one that we, we are exiting. I don't know when we're going to go back to school, but I highly suggest we do not go back to school until we have this virus crisis handled, until we have a vaccine for everybody. Um, and so when we do, quote unquote, go back to some semblance of what we might have had, maybe, you know, fewer students are in physical space schools and more students are in online schools. But I imagine by that point, we will have figured out how to do online schooling in a much more equitable, um, equitable way than, than we understand it right now. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty much all I can say about it because we just don't know what the future holds. On the topic of new normals, I think it's pretty clear that we're going to also be entering a, a new normal for the economy, not just for education. And we wanted to take some time to speak with you a little bit about some of your policy uh, initiatives that you've proposed. But first, I just wanted to kind of get your uh, feelings on uh, the state of the nation's economy right now as we approach the end of the CARE Act provisions. Uh, you know, most people are, uh, if not already running out of the unemployment benefits that were uh, passed, uh, there's certainly shortly ab uh, about to at the end of July. Uh, what kind of steps would you like to see from Congress? And then what kind of ideas would you bring, um, you know, should you arrive in? Uh, so you, you may have, uh, you, you probably heard of modern monetary theory. Um, catch the question, uh, I, I was somewhat distracted. But I, I think um, understanding that, that really, if we look at the history of um, how our economy has operated in recovery, uh, over the last 100 years, and we go back as far as like the Great Depression, when um, FDR bailed out not corporations so much, although in the lead up to World War II, that mobilization for World War II, um, you know, corporations did get a lot of business. They, did, they weren't allowed to war profiteer, but they got, you know, reasonable compensation for their services. Um, but but the recovery in the in, in the early 30s to bring us out of the Great Depression um, really went to the working class. You know, people got their jobs back. They got living wage um, and and we took care of a lot of people. Now, you know, uh, 
it certainly wasn't racially uh, equitable. We we know that, and so we're in a we're we're in a different understanding of of uh, racial equity right now. But if you track the the recoveries over the last hundred years, you start to see that because we we you know capitalism goes in this cycle up and down, up and down, up and down, um, and we the recoveries for the working class have consistently declined to the point where in 2008 with the with the great recession um a hundred percent the the top 10 percent of of wealth holders in this country got more than a hundred percent of their wealth back in the recovery for uh the 2008 recession which means 90 percent of the country lost ground so we already know the rich got richer the poor got poor the way we can stop that is what people are saying right now, we need a people stimulus. You need to be just giving people cash. One, you want to give them cash to stay home. If you can do a job from your house, then do your job from your house. My job, um, I'm, I'm a, a field inspector for an insurance company. I inspect commercial uh, properties uh, for safety, for fire hazards, for building condition, condition. And I tell them, you know, this is a safety hazard. You need to, you know, comply with this and whatever. It's a, it's a silly grunt job, but, you know, it, it has its purpose. Um, and, uh, but they, when, when the COVID crisis hit, they switched what I did to all online. My company was actually very, very good at saying, we don't want you out in the field. We don't want you making appointments anymore. We can have you do some valuable work for us at home. So anything that can be done at home, let it be done at home. We don't need people out mingling with each other, um, you know, as, as part of the new normal. I mean, it's going to be a much more socially distanced future until we get a vaccine. Um, so. We do need to be encouraging people to stay at home. Well, if people don't have jobs that they can, they can do at home or that their hours have been cut um, or that they've simply lost their jobs because their small business has gone under, we need to be giving those people money. They need to pay their rent. We do not want how, um, uh, to, to get into a, a housing crisis here, which we are, uh, we are getting into. Um, and people say, well, how are you going to pay for it, right? Well, Nobody ever says, how are you going to pay for war? And war has no economic benefit to this country. It has benefit to specific economic sectors like the, the weapons manufacturers and other areas of, of the defense industry uh, and maybe the transportation industry. But it has no general benefit to the economy. Every bullet that is fired, every bomb that is dropped has no economic return. It is money that just simply blows out into the ether. And then of course you, you, you're, you're killing people on top of it. So we need to read and, and all, and all of the war profiteer, I mean, all of the war budget actually does get factored into the GDP. So they can look at war as, Oh, our GDP is going up, but there's no benefit to the American public. So what we really need to do is redefine where our federal spending is on education, on health, healthcare, on housing, on sustainable energy. And those are the things that will have a benefit to the American people. We have to stop federal spending um, that, that has no general benefit other than to the already wealthy. And that's how we re need to redefine our economic priorities. On a similar subject, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, policing and uh, kind of the oppressive, increasingly oppressive police state we're finding ourselves in. Uh, you're in Washington, so given your proximity to the recent events that have been going on in Portland, um, just want to get your reaction to seeing unarmed peaceful protesters being beaten, maced, and abducted by feds without badges and unmarked vehicles. Uh, I can't help but think it kind of seems like we're we're experiencing the beginning of the end here. Well, you know, it 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 is it is terrifying in a way. Um, you know, I have I have endorsed a platform called uh, Ten Demands for Justice, ten tenforjustice.com. You might have read about. Yeah, you know, we've had awkward on the show. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. So he reached out to me and he said, "Hey, would you review this platform?" I got uh, the opportunity to contribute a couple of items to that. I was very proud of that effort. Uh, fully endorsed that. I'm actually um, going down to Portland tomorrow. I put out a call on Twitter today. Um, get me supplies. Get me food. Get me water. Get me medical supplies. Um, I'm going to head down to Portland. I will take people down there if they want to go join the protest. Now, as a congressional candidate, I have to be very careful because I will make. I will be a target and, and you know, if the, if the feds know who I am and they know I'm a congressional candidate, um, they, my campaign manager says, 
you know, if you can avoid going to ground zero down there, don't go on federal property. They are looking for an excuse to yank you. They will screw up your, your, your campaign. So, you know, I want to be there for peripheral support for this, but I'm probably not going to get myself in the mix like I did down in Seattle um, the night before the uh, the autonomous zone was established in Capitol Hill. Uh, I was right there up against the barriers. I was part of the first wave of protesters that hopped over those barriers and pushed the protest closer to the pre police. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I was there 15 feet from the police in the riot gear. Um, so I am I am in full support of you know, defunding the police, uh, we need to substantially, um, you know, and, 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 and what's going on in Portland aside, you know, uh, we, we need to radically alter our policing model, you know, and I want people to understand, you know, people ask me, you know, does that mean we should have no police at all? And I say, you know what, there are some legitimate needs for armed response in some incidents, but, but most of what, what, um, armed response goes to is it can be done by social work, by council work, counselors, by people who are trained to have a different kind of de-escalating non-armed response, um, or even you know stuff like traffic accidents. You know we don't need a po police to go out to a traffic accident. You know so we need to radically alter uh, what what policing is and make sure that armed response police only go to very specific incidents that may need an armed response and everything else goes to some other agency and then we have to have substantially better i've always said uh policing attracts bully psychopath mentalities um and you have to have a way to screen those people out, you have to have a way. I mean, you find out that you have a police officer that has any association with white supremacist group, groups, boom, they're out of there, gone. No second chances there. We are not going to have white supremacists on the seats to uh, police force. And, and, you know, if you have police that are charged with domestic abuse, uh, uh, and we know that the rates of domestic abuse are much higher on police forces than they are in the general population. You have a police officer that is, that is abusing their power uh, uh, on the general public. There are no second chances. You do that, you are gone, go find another job. Um, we have got to get rid of that element in policing. My brother-in-law was a police officer in Wisconsin for 13 years. And he told me, you know, I could talk to you for days about the corruption in the police force. And I couldn't say anything about it because I would make myself a target. And I need, I, you know, I got to have a job. I got to have health care. I'm taking care of a family too. And so the, the culture of policing isn't one that can police itself. Uh, and so we have to establish that culture with policing. Um, we have to demand it. And police forces, just like they did in Minneapolis, police forces that refuse to comply with that, boom, we'll figure out, we'll figure out something else. Get them gone. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, your proximity to the, the Washington protests, too. I didn't know that you were so directly uh, you know, involved with, the, with what happened down there with the Chaz and the Autonomous Zone. Uh, can you give us a little bit more insight into what, what the mood of the city was on the July 1st when it was dismantled? Or was there a resistance to that? Are people hoping to you know, take another? I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't down there for when it was being dismantled. I was there when it was established, and I've been there a couple of times since. Um, you know, with people, you know, and really it's giving people a voice about their own community and how they want their own community to be treated and how really they have respect for each other. I mean, the street community, the working class, they have respect for each other and they are disrespected by, you know, the oligarchy in general um, and by the police force, which are tools for the oligarchy. So the Chaz was there to give voice to, we as citizens demand to be treated better. And if we can't be treated better, if we won't be treated better, then we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna tear it down in other ways. And I, and I fully support that. Um, so I think uh, the, that kind of solidarity uh, puts a lot of fear into the establishment. Uh, they do not want people. That's what you know. The the shooting that happened, uh, and there was there was a guy killed and another guy wounded. We found out afterwards that that was a right wing agitator. That was some, that was yeah. a plant. Yeah. 
yeah, you know, obviously. and most of us knew it from the start, you know, that that was, that that was the way it was going, it was going to play out. Yeah. Um, because everything that I have experienced down there in those situations is peaceful. Yes. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, we're talking about love and community yeah. and that is something that the establishment does not want us to have. Yeah. That was and my it, big takeaway from the protests that I went to down here in Kansas city with uh, Zach. It was just, uh, you know, most people were extremely peaceful. Most people were, you know, pissed off, but they weren't like these will, these, these were very peaceful uh, people that were there for a expressed obvious reason. And it was not to, you know, yeah, you know, it kind of goes back to the chant that the protesters across the country has adopted, you know, uh, why are you in riot gear? We don't see no riot here. You know, they came looking to, you know, they came with hammers looking for nails, essentially. Yep. Uh, just to kind of pivot uh, quickly, while we want to be respectful of your time. I wanted to ask you about a, a sort of vanguard concept that you proposed uh, legislatively that I've, I've really found um, unique and, and, and um, something that I think would definitely be called for uh, a national solidarity fund. Could you tell people a little bit about that? Well, you know, we have to, um, it's, it's just, it's really just an idea of, of how we can get support from location to location. It's actually one of the reasons that I am going down to Portland to somebody who is in proximity to Portland and, and as working with local DSA groups, I've asked local DSA groups, will you, you know, can you stock my car so that we get our own internal supply chains? I mean, people are like, you know, I was just talking to somebody on Twitter today, you know, how do we do that? And I said, we have to have streetwise solidarity. We have to be in support. If we're in Seattle, we have to be supporting the movement in San Francisco and the movement in Los Angeles. As much as we can, we have to be able to get support from one location to another location um, uh, when it's needed. You know, so it, it's, it's kind of funny because the mentality is, you know, well, they can't come after all of us, right? I mean, what do you, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to shoot us all? You know, well, they might. <laughs> I don't know. They might. But the, but the way we sustain that is that we have support from location to location. So whether it is, and, and obviously it takes money, right? So if we have some kind of fund, we could say, here's where it needs to be right now. And, and if we can't get what we need in a direct location, then we can get what we need from periphery locations and bring it into that location. And that is, and we are going, because I think what's going on with Portland and what I've, I've heard from a, num from a number of other people is they want to test our response here. Yeah. They want to see not only what is the response going to be in Portland, um, and, and, you know, the, the naked woman, and I don't know her name, but she sat in front of the police and they did not know what to do with that. And that is an actual strategy that has been used before because it looks extremely bad for the police, the to go beating start, on, yeah. Yeah. you know, and they don't know what to do with it. So I thought that was fantastic. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, absolutely brilliant. But we need, we need to have that, that, that periphery support coming in and to know that they can't, they can't beat us down because what's going on in Portland is to see not only what the local response is going to be with the activists, but what is the national response response going to be? Are people going to turn their heads to people being disappeared on the street? Because if people turn their heads to that, they're going to say, good, we got you. We'll go anywhere and do this anywhere, anytime. So we've, we've got to be in solidarity with those people in Portland and make sure we're not going to allow it here. And what that will translate to is we're not going to allow it anywhere. Absolutely. Uh, Jason, for people who are inspired by what you've said, where can they go to support you? Um, callforcongress.com. That's F-O-R, not the number four. Uh, there's a donate link there. There's a volunteer link there. We're just getting started with our phone banking for the last two week push. Uh, we're starting to organize shifts for phone banking. Um, you know, locally, we've got sign waving uh, and, you know, we've got, like, like I told you at the beginning here, you know, we have, I, I'm, I would say even 100% confident that we are going to be on the general election ballot, in which case it's an entirely new race. I'm going against someone who raises and spends a million dollars every cycle, even when he doesn't need to. He's getting 75% of that funding from corporate sources. I'm running completely grassroots, no corporate money campaign, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, housing for everybody, free public transit, green sustainable transit, end the wars, defund the military, abolish ICE, all of it, you know, and that's one of the messages that I want to give is, you know, a lot of the, you know, centrists, I shouldn't even call them centrists, I call them corporate extremists, you know, these Democrats that are, are fine with 
a corporate run government, you know, um, that that they say, well, why do you have to ask for so much? Why can't you just focus on one thing? They are not recognizing the moment in history that we are in right now yeah. where we have to take it all. We have almost no working class representation in Congress. It's almost all corporate representation. We see the divide between the rich and the poor growing. We see people losing their housing, losing their health care. And so I say now is the time for solidarity and we are going to take it all and we're going to take it all at once. It's in call. Thank you so much. You. Yeah, appreciate Thanks it so much very much, us, man. We look forward to hearing uh, more about your election after that primary, and hopefully talking to you again soon in the future. Be happy to come back and talk to you. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>